Well, that entrance feels quite ridiculous in the context of what I'm going to be discussing with you over the next few minutes. See, the truth is that in spite of the prestigious titles that I've managed to acquire over the past 10 years, or the thousands and thousands of hours of watch time that I've created on hundreds of YouTube channels, most of which you people don't even know that I was behind. It's all been driven from a place of extreme insecurity. And this insecurity is not something that I've spoken publicly about. It's, to the best of my memory, never even been acknowledged, acknowledged in a media interview. And so, this will be my kind of premier discussion about growing up as a dyslexic. We'll go back. My childhood, in the beginning at least, kind of looked like a typical American film. Nice house, healthy, thin mother and father, and I was an average boy. Baseball, camping, Boy Scouts, everything that you would expect from an American childhood, until about the third grade. And I kind of remember the defining moment. See, in my school, we had what was called the reading corner. It was a place where the children could sit down, read books in privacy. It was kind of a little area nestled between some filing cabinets. But the issue was that by the third grade, reading, writing, spelling did not come to me whatsoever. Granted, most third graders are not scholars. Most of them can spell. And so I'd spend my time in the reading corner practicing sign language. <laughs> I had this idea that through sign language, I could communicate with friends in a special secret language. But there were a few issues with sign language. One was that beyond the alphabet, I couldn't learn actual words because I couldn't read simple words. I couldn't read colors. I couldn't read names. So learning an actual sign language vocabulary was not a possibility for me. The second problem being, although I could learn the alphabet, I think I still remember something. <laughs> I couldn't spell anything with it, canceling any ambition of learning sign language. And when I was back there with my sign language book, the definitive moment was when my teacher peered in, as she often would do for the students. But this time she had a look of deep concern in her eyes. And even as a child, I knew that something was not right. You see, she knew the divinity of my future, being a dyslexic. And so they signed me up for weeks and weeks of testing, testing in many different realms. And at the conclusion of it, they informed my mother that there's good news. Your third grade son has a presumed IQ of 140, but he's dyslexic. He's learning disabled. He'll do nothing with his above average IQ. And in fact, in the years to follow, they were very right about that. If you're learning disabled, if you have this disability, high IQ will do nothing. You can't put the input in. At least that's how they approached the situation. No one informed me as to the purpose of these tests. No one informed me that I was dyslexic. Actually, the only reason that I know my IQ is because about three weeks ago before I planned this talk, I asked my mother, okay, tell me, what were the results of that test? And so when I went to the fourth grade, I was completely unprepared for what would ensue. I entered the classroom. I'm sure all of you were nervous on your first days back to school. Hell, your first day back at university even is a little bit nerve-wracking. You have to meet new people. Um, but my class was different. I immediately noticed that it was smaller in size, that there were less children in this class, and that the children within the class were nothing like the children that I had known in my daily life. They were nothing like the children I had known in years prior at school. 
and seemingly they were far off from what we know in society. There was a range of disabilities within my class from cerebral palsy. I presume as an adult that kids were autistic. The primary issue were behavior problems, kids who were violent. Now, as an adult, I realized that there's reason for this. Kids acquire violent behavior and tendencies because they come from pathological homes. But as a child, you only align yourself with your peers. And so the biggest fear that I never knew I had was realized in that moment that I had to accept that I was now in the small class. And in American schools in the 80s and 90s, everyone knew what the small class was. It was the place for imbeciles. This is the way other students saw it. And the schools seemed to do everything in their power to encourage us being ostracized. Small examples, again, quite ridiculous from the prospect of adult eyes, but as a child, if your class is made to walk in a single file line as the rest roam freely, you know something is not right with these group of people. If you're designated to a specific place in the lunchroom as the rest of the kids roam freely, the rest of the kids see something is not right with this group of people. And so I went from a normal childhood to visiting school and being confrontated with bullying on a daily basis, wicked bullying, bullying of my intellect. And although it may seem hard to imagine me standing here, eventually this only concludes in one way, especially as a boy in the 90s, violence. And I would always ask people who called me retarded to hit me, hit me right in the face. And I don't know if that was the right thing to do looking back, but I always, always respond by hitting them much harder. And a few times, of course, I would lose fights, sometimes I would win, but I felt like a piece of trash. And frankly, I didn't care if I would lose or I would win. If you feel like trash, you have nothing to lose. You could be beaten, spit on, called names, it doesn't matter, especially as a child. The other thing that happened that really aggravated our situation in the small class is that they actually moved us from the wing with the fourth graders to the wing of the school with the younger classes, the third graders. So it was perceived by my peers that not only were we so stupid that we needed to be in this smaller class, quote unquote, but we needed to be moved to an entire different wing of the building. And then the school took the next step of adding children of different age groups to the class. So when all the other kids were learning to read, write, and spell, I didn't know if I would be stabbed by a pencil or drooled on, frankly speaking. And those are literal examples of the situations I would have to deal with on a daily basis. Now, when I came back to school in the fifth grade, the process was already complete. I felt like trash. There was no way to defend it, but my mother was concerned for my state of mind. Obviously, she observed that her child was dealing with some new demons that she didn't expect. And so she, <laughs> and this is kind of a funny story, elected to sign me up as a helper for people with severe mental disabilities, such as Down syndrome. So, twice a week after school, would be taken to a special other school where children who suffered of Down syndrome would have activities. But there was miscommunication between my mothers and the organizers of this after-school activity in that they did not realize that I was there to help. So I was treated the same as the other students who were suffering of severe mental disabilities. And so by fifth grade, I started really pondering the question, am I mentally retarded? In fact, on account of all of the children calling me retarded, and this after-school program, 
where I was doing activities with people older than me who were unable to speak, eat, do anything normally, I was completely convinced that I was mentally retarded. And retarded is a strong word. It's not PC, but I feel every right to use it as this is what I was referred to for years and years. Now, eventually, if you call someone a name long enough, they'll take on the label. They'll become what you've ostracized them to be. So you might notice in my social media profiles that at times I refer to myself as a dyslexic bastard, and I've never explained that to anyone. Well, now you know. By sixth grade, I was antisocial. I was aggravated. I was suicidal. And the only people who embraced me were children from Mexican immigrant homes. They had their own struggles, believe me. But I was included in their world. And this is when I came upon a very defining moment, in fact. Uh, they invited me to join a gang called the Latin Kings. You can look up the Latin Kings on the internet later and see that it was a very notorious gang in the United States. And I accepted this invitation, in fact. I accepted it. I felt empowered by it. The same way, funny enough, that I feel empowered or vindicated by a successful film that I participate in. Joining a gang is the street's version of a safe space, and that's what a lot of people do not understand. I started to study all of the kind of entry obligations to become an official member of this gang, from the gang symbols that I could still throw up right now if I wanted to, to the colors, and of course, the gang fonts. And now, the final step in joining a gang, most gangs in the United States, is being beaten in. And this is when the other gang members come, and they beat you, and they give you the beating of your life. And I was scheduled, I was set. I didn't care if it would hurt or not. In fact, I was looking forward to the pain because somehow it would vindicate me as a stronger individual, stronger than my peers who ridiculed me constantly. This would give me an image. But I did not attend, I did not attend my beaten for a few reasons. The first thing is that one of my friend's sisters was murdered in a drive-by shooting. Uh, she was wearing the wrong colors. The second thing is that my friend Andy, who was also scheduled to join the gang, was threatened by gang members of a rival gang. Well, he claims that they threatened to kill him. That's very scary, scary, horrible business. And the third thing, probably what discouraged me the most from finalizing my introduction to a gang, happened during a D.A.R.E. lesson. In the 90s, police officers would come to American schools to educate the children about drugs. In fact, it worked on me. I never touched a drug in my life. I've never touched alcohol in my life. So, good program. But as the program was hosted and taught by real-life police officers, we had contact with them on a daily basis. And as the police were examining um, our notebooks for some project that we were doing, I had written all of my answers using the gang font. <laughs> And the police officer looked in my eyes the same way that my third grade teacher had looked in my eyes. And I could just see that I was on some path to evil, that I was on a path of no return that I needed to back out of. Thankfully, I did. After the sixth grade, my mother saw that I hit rock bottom, and she started to fight with the state, petitioning my exit from the learning disabled class. Fortunately, she was successful. It was not an easy task for her to accomplish. And in the seventh grade, I entered the mainstream. But I had a whole new set of problems because in the time that other kids were getting educated, I had a very, very different experience. I saw what the inside of a marijuana factory looks like. They learned how to spell, read, read out loud especially. So I had a lot of catching up to do. 
Every time the teacher called out me to read out loud, I'd panic. In fact, I'd say, I pass. And they said, you can't pass, you have to do it, you know, you're going to fail. Uh, it, was, it was quite miserable. In fact, to this day, if I was given a sheet of paper to read out loud, I'd be 1,100 times more terrified than I am just to give this presentation. It's something that I can simply not do. My past has followed me. I believe that it always will. Now, in seventh grade, I did manage to regain some social status within the school, and I was mostly accepted by the normal kids which was a humongous relief for me. I stopped associating with uh, criminal types almost altogether. That was only, I think, a moment of necessity, which probably most people who have criminal friends have also been faced with similar, if not much, much worse scenarios than mine. But the other children from the small class, they still tried to maintain contact with me and I couldn't do it. I wanted absolutely nothing to do with them. I didn't want to talk to them on the phone. I didn't want to see them. I didn't want to hear about them. I didn't want to think about it. It was an extreme point of shame to me, so much so that of all the things that I've shown publicly in the internet over the years, this is one thing that I've never really spoken on. And one day at school, two of my close friends from the learning disabled class approached me, and they told me they were concerned that I was leaving them, and that they'd no longer have me in their circle, Arturo and Joe. And they were absolutely right. I wouldn't be shooting out windows with Arturo in his trailer park, and I wouldn't be making prank phone calls with Joe ever again. I had no such intention. What I didn't realize then as a kid is the frailty of life. See, the ultimate harsh effect that this small class had I think no one could imagine. Arturo, he died as an adolescent in a car crash with three other of my classmates, took out their parents' car, crashed it into an ambulance. Dead. Gone. Joe, he's also dead. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, the majority of my classmates from the small class are either dead, in jail, addicted to drugs, and somehow I am here in Krakow, Poland, speaking to you, capable, beautiful students. And I feel it's unfair. And Joe, Arturo, my other classmates, who were not as lucky as I was to somehow prevail that horrific environment, they'll never have the opportunity to visit Krakow, Poland, and they'll never have the opportunity to be listened to by you people. So thank you very much for hearing my story.